I am David Gartenstein Ross. I'm a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and the chief executive officer of the consulting firm Valens Global. I work on uh, issues related to national security, uh, privacy, and individual rights uh, professionally, uh, having both advised a variety of governments, including uh, the U.S. and Dutch government, and also done uh, fairly interesting uh, client work in the oil and gas and tech sector, looking at the way violent non-state actors uh, operate in the world today. Uh, the CLS 21 debates are a fantastic opportunity, a very interesting topic that is so much at the center of what we're thinking about, uh, both uh, as a, a government and also as um, a public in both the United States and Europe. Uh, the tragic events that we saw in France back in November and uh, in March in uh, Belgium underscore the importance of the topic and underscore the importance of trying to get the balance right. Uh, there are three different issues that you're going to be thinking through, and what I'm going to do is provide somewhat of a guide to how you might go about researching and uh, thinking about these topics. Um, the three topics which you may be called upon to discuss are freedom of expression, domestic surveillance, and legitimacy. Freedom of expression is uh, a very broad topic, and obviously uh, freedom of expression lies uh, at the center of the rights that we cherish uh, in the United States. There's a reason the First Amendment comes first. Uh, European countries, and uh, the CLS 21 debates are focused on Europe, uh, have a somewhat uh, different stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, freedom of expression. I think the very first thing that's worth doing is looking at what the legal system currently holds in order to understand the backdrop against which uh, this discussion occurs. Uh, the European uh, perspective on freedom of expression does not perfectly align with that of the United States. Uh, the second thing I would think about is how is it that violent non-state actors, militant groups, uh, are trying to exploit uh, this system of freedom of expression because understanding what uh, the uh, adversary is doing is necessary to understanding uh, how it situates vis-a-vis uh, uh, the system of rights that they might enjoy. Uh, in this case, uh, the Islamic State in particular, or ISIS as it's popularly known, has been extraordinarily good at both leveraging on the ground networks. Uh, the group called Sharia for Belgium has been uh, one uh, network that's been at the center of helping foreign fighters to move from Europe into the Syria and Iraq theater. Um, and they've also been very good at utilizing online networks, online expression uh, through mediums such as Twitter um, and now Telegram and others uh, where they've been able to uh, both uh, radicalize, uh, recruit, and mobilize people uh, using these online media of communication. So when it comes to freedom of expression, uh, the question is uh, to what extent should they be allowed to do so? To what extent does uh, allowing um, these groups to operate in the open uh, end up protecting the rights of us all? Uh, certainly, uh, one of the foundations of freedom of speech in the United States uh, is that um, protecting offensive speech is important because it's only offensive speech that's going to be censored. So to what extent is it important to allow this speech to exist because censoring it might uh, lead to censorship of otherwise objectionable speech? Um, you know, speech that we think should be a part of the discourse but that some people would object to. Uh, second question is, uh, does trying to shut speech down, uh, such as the Islamic State recruiting networks, does that result in it being driven underground and being more dangerous? Uh, another fundamental precept of American freedom of speech is that of the marketplace of ideas. And uh, good speech or counter speech uh, can end up uh, displacing bad speech. Now we're in a situation where that certainly doesn't work perfectly for ISIS. Uh, we've seen that uh, rather than good speech just diffusing bad speech, uh, people have mobilized quickly, extraordinarily quickly. There's not time for reasoned debate and to dissuade people from going over to take part in an organization that's committing genocide, taking sex slaves, and beheading people on camera. Uh, instead, uh, this online medium has been used directly to mobilize people to kill and mobilize people to undertake brutality. Uh, so that's the debate as, as it will occur. It's one of uh, balancing rights against security with a couple of uh, very important questions embedded in it. And it's not uh, an issue to uh, be taken lightly given how much we cherish our freedom of speech on the one hand, and on the other hand, how um, 
ISIS has made use of this freedom to mobilize people to kill and mobilize people to commit atrocities in other countries. The second issue is domestic surveillance. Uh, as with uh, the United States, understanding what the European backdrop is and differences uh, between um, the uh, expectation of privacy in the US and Europe is uh, important. Um, the question for domestic surveillance really uh, is one where, on the one hand, uh, the government now has a phenomenal ability to pry into people's lives uh, the way it never could before, given how much of our lives have migrated online. Um, and on the other hand, uh, you have uh, groups that seek to carry out mass carnage, as we've seen in Paris and as we saw in Brussels. Uh, in fact, um, a good portion uh, of the uh, current story deals with uh, European uh, intelligence services losing their ability uh, to conduct uh, surveillance, not because of government restrictions, uh, but rather because of um, developments in technology. Uh, after the Edward Snowden revelations about the extent of uh, U.S. and European surveillance, there was an explosion in encryption technology, uh, which has um, impeded intelligence services as never before in undertaking electronic surveillance. This is particularly important because uh, European uh, security and intelligence services have long been extraordinarily overstretched. They've all but been waving their hands to uh, explain how the resources can't be devoted across the board to looking at this issue. Um, the reason why is you've had this perfect storm of the migrant crisis which has gripped Europe where um, European intelligence services are overstretched trying to vet migrants coming in, uh, trying to prevent native, nativist backlash, and at the same time uh, deal with the foreign fighter flows where you've had um, as uh, about 6,000 Western Europeans go over to Iraq and Syria to join jihadist organizations. Um, now this explosion in encryption technology came at the same time that they were already overstretched t trying to deal with these pre-existing problems. It takes about uh, two dozen officers to conduct 24-7 surveillance on a single terrorist suspect. And so in the past, these intelligence services have made up for uh, what they lack in terms of uh, ability to conduct human surveillance by conducting electronic surveillance. Uh, suddenly, though, uh, they've lost their ability to do that as effectively as they could in the past. Uh, that's had an impact in terms of increasing the amount of blind spots. Domestic surveillance, uh, just like freedom of speech, ends up balancing two core things. On the one hand, security, where we unfortunately have uh, two major glaring examples, and that's not even counting the January attack uh, that occurred in 2015 uh, at the offices of Charlie Hebdo and uh, the kosher supermarket, which was also a spectacular attack, though something that we forget about now in light of what's occurred previously. So it balances security, on the one hand, um, against uh, the rights of privacy that also um, are extremely important to all of us, and very justifiably so. Uh, Europe has tended to um, be much more uh, vigilant about rights to privacy vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, corporations who could uh, uh, pry into people's lives. One of the big ways that a number of companies uh, that operate on the internet uh, end up um, making money is by getting to know their customers, getting to know everything about them, uh, taking a big data approach to understanding preferences. Uh, Europe uh, has much more of a protective view on what companies should be allowed to uh, pry into in people's lives than the United States does. Uh, at the same time, uh, European governments also uh, tend to spy a bit more on their populations. Um, so the question is, where should that line be drawn? Uh, in researching the question, I would look at basic uh, theories of privacy, um, including the jurisprudence of privacy, uh, but also um, I would look at uh, the ways in which uh, um, ability to uh, monitor uh, suspects uh, is is important. When should uh, the government be, government be forced to get a warrant? When can it conduct warrantless surveillance? Um, where where does one draw the line in terms of these policies? The final issue that you're going to discuss is mobility. Uh, the big uh, issue in uh, Europe is the Schengen Zone Agreement, uh, which provided for uh, basically borderless uh, travel. Uh, within Europe. That is, uh, you could travel anywhere within the Schengen Zone um, for decades without uh, having anyone check your passport or make sure that you're there properly. At most borders in the world, uh, you will be checked, your passport and identity paper documents will be checked on the way in. The Schengen Agreement has recently broken down. 
uh, under the weight of the migrant crisis. For the first time, um, you have governments imposing um, you know, barriers to other countries, to, to entry from other countries. Um, these checkpoints, which had been disestablished, are now going back up, uh, in part because you have numerous states that are concerned uh, that they can't handle the uh, inflow of new population uh, and are concerned about this from you know, a financial uh, crime and cultural uh, aspect. Now, the other thing that mobility has been key to uh, is, um, you know, on, on the uh, negative side of the ledger, has been terrorist movement throughout uh, the continent. After the Paris attacks that occurred in November, uh, quite notoriously, one of the would-be attackers, Salah Abdus Salam, was able to leave Paris and travel to Brussels, where he was staked out for some time, only being arrested in the Malenbuk neighborhood of Brussels just a few days before uh, the notorious attack occurred in the Brussels mass transit system and at the Brussels airport. Uh, the key question for the mobility section uh, is um, how advantageous is the Schengen Agreement? Uh, what is the advantage to having borderless travel? There's both uh, rights-based implications, uh, but a second implication to being able to travel without a border is policing resources. Policing borders is expensive, uh, it's resource intensive, uh, it impedes commerce within uh, the European zone. Uh, the flip side is um, some commentators argue that essentially uh, jihadist groups are, are operating uh, transnationally as are other militant organizations while policing efforts stop at the borders. Uh, one thing that uh, teams can look into uh, on this particular topic is the question of you know, are there other uh, alternatives to uh, shutting down and policing the borders? Are there alternatives such as, uh, for example, making uh, policing more Europe-wide Europe uh, rather than having it be uh, the pr provincial and bureaucratic morass that it has often been? Uh, these are three very interesting and very important topics. Uh, I applaud uh, the CLS 21 debates for taking them up and for uh, giving you the opportunity to think through these issues that we're going to be grappling with, not just in the weeks ahead, but for years to come. And I wish you all the best of luck.